this is the first of a of a series that Cantify is hosting on Lenin and Leninism in the in the 21st century. Um, and you know, I, I don't need to tell people here, but of course, Lenin was one of the most important figures of the 20th uh, century, uh, who was central to the Russian Revolution in 1917 and was uh, a Marxist thinker and activist uh, who is often ignored or denigrated when he is mentioned in the in the mainstream. Uh, even Putin felt the need to chat shit about him. Um, but whose ideas I think remain incredibly relevant for socialists today. Um, that's Lenin, not Putin. Um, the aim of this series is to identify or re-identify some of the key contributions uh, of Lenin to Marxist thought and, and practice and to try and understand its application in the struggles today. And this meeting today is on imperialism, which I think is particularly uh, relevant given the war in Ukraine and the changing uh, dynamics of, of global power relations. Um, and I think Lenin's study and explanation uh, of imperialism gives us a framework to <clears throat> to understand what is happening uh, and why and, and what it is that we can and must do. Uh, and we know that there is a huge amount of, of confusion and manipulation on this question, both in the in the kind of wider public sphere and also uh, within the left. So I think returning to this framework uh, is essential. But I'd like to start first with the kind of concrete situation. And that is that at the moment we are 11 weeks into Russia's brutal invasion um, and occupation of Ukraine, which is causing misery, death and destruction on a massive scale. Uh, we know that thousands of uh, civilians have been killed and millions have been forced to flee. Uh, and in this country, we're faced with a, a barrage of the daily grotesque details of the war and of, of war crimes, because in this instance, our government is not the immediate aggressor. And because our government wants to differentiate this war from the wars that it has been central to. Um, and of course, this war is different in terms of what it represents geopolitically and, and what the consequences uh, will be in world politics. But the barbarity of uh, war and occupation uh, are the same as what our country was party to in the destruction of Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Libya, Syria, uh, and is still centrally committed to in Yemen and Palestine and elsewhere. Um, and, and in Palestine, we saw in the last week the horrific scenes of the assassination of <coughs> Shireen Abu Akhla and, and the attack on, on her funeral. Uh, but we are told, nonetheless, that this war in Ukraine, uh, which is a war in Europe, is different, it is more inhumane, and that it is the action uh, of a deranged dictator uh, who is acting irrationally and so on. Um, and trying to explain the war as the outburst of a lunatic is one way of papering over the reality that this war is rooted in decades of NATO expansionism uh, or that any semblance of a so-called rules-based international order was destroyed uh, first and repeatedly by the West. Um, and I think the other way, which is something that the establishment tried to do in every aspect of our lives, uh, is to separate politics and, and economics, to obfuscate the material reality of the world by having us believe that politics and economics are two separate and distinct things which only sometimes intersect. Um, and this is something which I think Marxism in general uh, debunks, but which I think Lenin in particular helped uh, to solidify an understanding of, uh, of why they're inseparable in terms of the question of war. And the military Theorist Clausewitz uh, often quoted adage is that war is uh, politics by other means. Um, so if politics and economics are in fact inseparable, then war is also an extension of economics and it is rooted uh, in the capitalist system itself. Um, even um, for some who make this basic connection, however, this is often reduced into a kind of vague notion of a military industrial complex uh, or the lobbying power of the arms industry. Uh, and that is only a, a small part of the picture. Um, and I think the, the benefit of, of Lenin's analysis is that it developed Marxist theory to show how war is central to the development and the operation of capitalism as a whole. Um, and that is that war is, is a feature of imperialism and imperialism in its modern sense is uh, a fundamental feature of capitalism um, in that it is an expression of the logic uh, of competition that is central to capitalism and is arrived at by specific processes which are the prevailing tendencies within capitalism. Um, and to try and summarize <clears throat> a little bit about um, 
this theory and the central process that, that Lenin identifies, uh, it is that the, the centralization uh, of, uh, of capitalism, in Marx's words, is uh, one of the imminent laws of capitalism itself. And that's because the logic of competition, uh, some because of the logic of competition, some companies in particular uh, industries are able to grow bigger by beating their competitors, uh, driving them out of business or subsuming them. And this leads to a concentration of production in a, in a smaller pool of capitalists uh, and in the emergence of monopolies. And the role of banks and financial institutions further exacerbates this process uh, and gives them greater control of capital. Uh, and individual capitalists uh, or capitalist entities then dominate entire sections of the economy and increasingly multiple sections of the economy. Uh, and uh, and all, as well as becoming financial institutions in their own right. And a good example uh, of this in recent years has been companies like Amazon and Google, who are not only dominant companies in the industries that they kind of started out in, but also have huge chunks uh, of market share in, in other industries, as well as becoming financial lenders uh, themselves. And all of this leads to less and less uh, competition between them, uh, because there's less and less of a market to compete over. And eventually, they need to look outwards in order to try and expand further to keep making profits. Uh, and Lenin describes this as the rapid extension of a close network of uh, canals which cover the whole country, centralizing all capital and all revenues, uh, transforming thousands and thousands of scattered economic enterprises into a single national capitalist, and then into an international capitalist economic unit. Um, and as Marx and Engels described the capitalist state, uh, which we'll be talking about more next week, uh, as a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie, you have uh, what, what you see is a deepening in the relationship between the state and uh, the, the kind of smaller and smaller group of, of big capitalists who now hold huge amounts of influence over large sections of the economy. And the state represents their aligning interests as a single economic unit in competing with uh, the national capital uh, capitalist interests of other countries and thereby competing on an international level. And this is what imperialism, imperialism is. It means countries expressing their relative strengths uh, economically as a means of partitioning the world, often requiring the use of military force to subjugate weaker countries. Um, and for example, Lenin uh, explains that in 1876, which he identifies was the point at which monopolies had become uh, the dominant form of, of, of the organization of production in the most advanced capitalist countries. Um, at this point, around 10% uh, of Africa had been colonized by European powers. Um, and by 1900, he says that 90% of Africa had been colonized. Uh, and what he says is that it is beyond doubt, therefore, that capitalism's transition uh, to the stage of monopoly capitalism to finance capitalism uh, is connected with the intensification of the struggle for the partitioning of the world. And he quotes uh, Joseph Chamberlain uh, as advocating for imperialism as a true, wise and economical policy. Um, <clears throat> And because of the ever-changing relative strengths uh, of countries, uh, the partitioning of the world only leads to the repartitioning of the world as the balance of forces change. Um, and as Lenin said, peaceful alliances prepared the ground for wars and in their turn grow out of wars. Uh, one is the condition of the other, giving rise to alternating forms of peaceful and non-peaceful struggle on one and the same basis that of imperialist connections and interrelations of world economics and world politics. So on this basis, you can see why uh, colonialism was central to the development of capitalism and why the inter-imperialist uh, rivalries of the, of the 19th and 20th centuries led directly to the First World War, uh, which is when Lenin wrote uh, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. And the First World War was ended uh, by uh, the revolution and the removal from the war of Russia and the mutinies of German soldiers that followed, uh, some of the key things which are left out in mainstream accounts of the war. Uh, but it was a war um, of partitioning the world and it ended with sowing the seeds for further imperialist conflict down the line as the European powers 
uh, were weakened in the course of the war and as the US entered the global picture as an economic power. And following the end of the Second World War, we entered a new phase in which two dominant global powers remain, the US and Russia, uh, and the Western European powers, who were the former colonial powers that ruled the world between them, were subordinated to US capital um, <clears throat> and other countries were sub subordinated to Russia. And thus we had kind of the 45 years of the Cold War between the two main powers over control of the spheres of influence uh, that they had, uh, which of course uh, had hot wars within it in Korea and Vietnam, and which brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. And Lenin's framework of how imperialism operates helps us to uh, explain how and why this happened because of that logic of competition, because of the monopoly organization of production within the advanced economies and the need to maintain control of as much of the world uh, and with it the national the natural resources the access to labor the trade routes the markets um, and equally to stop your rival from having control uh, of those things and during this this period we saw the the, the kind of decolonization uh, process um, as a as a result of popular uh, national liberation movements and uh, a weakened Europe which threw off the old chains of uh, imperialism that shackled countries in the global south but which were quickly reconfigured into new neo-colonial chains with uh, you know the new global powers at the helm um, and these relationships of exploitation, of debt, of forced policies, of, of liberalizing markets, uh, reducing regulations and weakening labor laws allowed the imperialist nations in the West to maintain <clears throat> uh, their control of much of the world. And importantly, it went hand in hand with shifting uh, of huge parts of industrial production from the imperial core into the, into the global periphery. And since the end of the Cold War, we had essentially another repartitioning of the world, which uh, moved us into a unipolar world with the US as the global superpower. And of course, this didn't bring uh, peace either, because as Lenin explained, partitioning only leads to repartitioning. And within the globalized capitalist system, the US found a constant need to maintain its control by force uh, and to stymie the development of future uh, rivals. And NATO, which had been founded during the Cold War, with the intention, according to Lord Ismay, of keeping the Russians out, the Germans down and the Americans in, expressed this logic uh, and it continued to be an imperialist organization and to adapt in order to maintain the US's uh, strategic goals. Um, and it's through this that we see the road that was paved uh, to the war in Ukraine today with the belligerence of NATO and expanding up to Russia's borders, knowing that it would provoke uh, a response and sacrificing Ukrainian lives anyway, uh, as a means of keeping the Russians out of the, the global, um, the core of the global capitalist order. Uh, and as a result of the relative decline of the West, both uh, economically um, and uh, militarily in the defeats of uh, in, a, in a Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and Syria. Um, so this is why I think Lenin's framework is ex extremely important to understand, and I think it tells us four things. Um, and the first is that this war is one part of a new phase um, of at least the attempted repartitioning of the world. And I think Russia has attempted to reflect the imbalance uh, of power uh, with facts on the ground, as it were, and to reassert itself uh, as a power on the world stage. Um, the second is that we are uh, kind of following on from that, that we are moving towards a, a multipolar world uh, again um, with, with China on, on the road to overtaking the US economically uh, and the ramifications that this will have in terms of um, their kind of uh, national monopoly interests uh, and the relative power of, of uh, the US uh, economy and the scramble for new spheres uh, of influence and so on. Um, the third thing I think is that both uh, that I think it's important to understand and that flows from this analysis is that both Russia and China are imperialist powers, that they are both capitalist countries and in which uh, monopolies are the dominant modes of organizing production. And we've seen particularly during the last two years of the coronavirus uh, production, uh, the acceleration of this process uh, of monopolization with fewer and fewer um, 
billionaires, uh, you know, uh, massively expanding their wealth and having a bigger and bigger influence on uh, whole sectors of the economy. And this is the same in China as it is in the US. Um, and of course, you know, Russia is, is a relatively small um, country economically, but, um, but China is far larger and it has been embarking on a program of aid and investment in the global south in a similar fashion to the US uh, and, and, and Europe's neo-colonial relationships with countries in, in Africa, Asia and Latin America. And I think this is important to understand because it is a, a developing situation and whatever the outcome of the, the war in Ukraine, which unfortunately at the moment looks like it's going to be a long war, um, this is a reconfiguration of global politics and of inter-imperialist rivalry. And I think we need to be clear on that. Um, I think the fourth thing uh, that we can take from Lenin's analysis is that opposing imperialism is not an optional extra uh, for socialists. It is a, a central thing that, that we uh, have to take on, uh, that we have to recognize that our uh, main enemy is at home and that our country is playing a role in, in the wars and in the imperial carve up uh, of the world that is happening. And that as ultimately that these wars are rooted in the logic of the capitalist system itself and therefore only uh, only a, a, a complete overthrow of this system can stop the causes for war and the drive uh, for more war. Um, and, you know, as well as um, uh, overcoming this, this false idea of a separation between the political and the economic, um, we also uh, what Lenin does is is he makes clear that there isn't a separation between the foreign and the domestic, uh, and we can see that playing out very clearly uh, now. If if we hadn't before that, um, you know this this war is is affecting everything that happens uh, domestically, and we see that in terms of the kind of direct uh, impact it's having on the cost of living crisis, uh, but also in terms of how our government is. Um, uh, attacking anti-war activists and protest in general and, and clamping down on our civil liberties, that it is uh, ramping up exploitation and, and uh, cracking down on workers organizing, and that it is trying to massively boost uh, defense spending, uh, which is of course money that could be used um, in other parts of the economy where it's actually needed to help working people. Um, so I think we have to, uh, resist the calls that are unfortunately there on some part of the left's about arming Ukraine and which are essentially uh, going along with our government's line on these things and which in a sense is going to be a, a part of strengthening our imperialism against Russian imperialism and we have to reject that we have to be uh, against imperialism on both sides and we have to uh, campaign against uh, our government uh, first and foremost here and I think just to end with with kind of what that practically means for socialists now, I think that means urgently organizing and rebuilding the anti-war movement um, in all parts of the country and which can work uh, internationally with the anti-war movement in Russia, with the anti-war movement in the US. Uh, and, and, you know, to put these questions at the heart of, of what we're doing and to make it clear that these this isn't separate from the cost of living crisis, from the climate crisis uh, and, and everything else. Um, and also that we build revolutionary organization uh, within the movement and that we put forward this analysis that we make uh, these things clear uh, and that we build on that basis. Um, and I'll end there. Thank you.